Rena Point Bolton has been weaving for more than 70 years. When I was 10, I think 10 or 11, I made my first basket by myself. <laughs> and and uh, Do you remember that feeling? Yes. Uh, I was so anxious, I couldn't wait to, to get going on it. At the time, potlatches and the creation of Aboriginal art were banned by the government. But her mother and grandmother taught her the songs, history, and arts of her people and gave her the responsibility to keep them alive. Because our arts and crafts are unique in this world, the beautiful carvings and weavings, the feasts, the songs and the dances, I wanted so desperately for the world to know that we're still here. And so I went out and I worked with the politicians to revive what we were losing so quickly. Rena learned the traditional arts of not only the Stalo and Thompson nations of her mother and father, but also the Sinsian arts of her husband's territory. But to her, the important work was teaching. I tried to do my part by teaching after I learned different ways of, of weaving from different uh, nations. I started teaching uh, to get the younger people interested. I guess it's one of the greatest feelings I have is knowing that I took part in reviving our ancient crafts. But it wasn't easy reviving a culture. She encountered resistance from elders. When I traveled out to the different villages, it was difficult to make them understand that they would not be uh, fined or put in jail, you know, because they were terrified of the police, the elders, you know, the real old ladies. She wouldn't have said so then, but now she can say that saving the culture was not just about art, it was also political. Yes, <laughs> it was in a way. I guess I wanted them to, to, to stand up and be proud of who they are and maybe fight a little for what, what they, they originally owned and, and they, they gave it up. And uh, I guess it was a political statement. Uh, I probably wouldn't have admitted it at the time, but now I, <laughs> I don't mind now. <laughs> And while she spent a lifetime producing great works of art, she doesn't see that as her greatest contribution. Teaching has always been where I seem to fit in. And, and doing my work is just something I do to satisfy myself, <laughs> where I can relax and think about other things. She doesn't teach anymore. She weaves. And she's done it so long, it's become a meditation. It's a meditation. I think of my elders, I think of my children, and uh, I pray a lot. I think of what may happen in the future to my people um, because things have gotten too fast and, and the beauty of our slow life has just about finished. Our way of living was a good way because uh, we didn't destroy anything. We didn't destroy the land. Um, we lived in harmony with nature. We took only what we needed. It seems like our people, our young people today, have forgotten who they are. And they don't take pride in themselves or, or the land that used to belong to their elders. These are the things that I think about and I wonder how long it will be before everyone forgets that there was a First Nations. Perhaps even the First Nations will forget. So Rena sees her Lifetime Achievement Award as a validation, not just of her achievements, but of the culture itself. And for this ceremony, she weaves some special things. A headdress of cedar bark, ermine, and abalone shell. A pounded cedar bark cape that used to be worn as a rain cape. And a stallow style root basket. Yeah, things, uh, it, it's, it's time that the awards start coming out now. It, it, it's all falling into place. It took a long time. 
And, and like I say, I didn't think I'd be here to, <laughs> to see this happen. <laughs>